for the camera. Yeah, no, she's hiding behind the stovepipe there. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about food waste today, which is an enormous subject because it includes everything there is about food, how you raise it, how you move it, how you preserve it, how you cook it. So I'm going to just cover the basics um, to get, kind of give you an idea. I like to start with telling you how agriculture came to Colorado. Uh, and of course it started with the gold rush. Uh, you would think, okay, well, how does agriculture work? I have to do with gold rush. Well, it brought a lot of people here, a lot of miners. They needed to feed the miners. They uh, also wanted to be self-sufficient communities. So they needed people, families also, for some stability and some respectability. They needed the fa farm families to come in and uh, do the farming. But it was different farming out here. It wasn't like the farming back east where you had rain. <laughs> And you had, you know, a little better soil. So they knew they would need to use irrigation. The canals would need to be built and maintained. Individual farmers who came out had a hard time. It was hard work to dig the canals or it was too much money. Um, so they needed another plan. And some actu actually some businessmen in New York had an idea. They decided to form the Union Colony. And what they did was they charged people $155 for a membership. And they got thousands of people. So they had all this money, and they would buy a big plot, of, I mean, acres and acres of land. Each person that was a member, their family, would get a plot of farmland and a plot in the town that would be built. And the extra money would be used for public buildings, schools, churches, libraries, whatever they needed. No saloons, no billiard halls. <laughs> that was one of the rules they had. Uh, thousands of people came out around 1870 or so, and this Union Colony became one of the uh, cities here in Colorado. Anybody know what that colony is now called? Besides coal? No. <laughs> yes? Denver. Not Denver. It's Greeley. Greeley. It's Greeley. 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 We're just still here. Well, that went so well that some people in Chicago thought they were going to do it, too. So they did exactly the same thing. They got a lot of people together. Everybody pitched in their money. This way they, and, and the money also went to building the irrigation canals. So everybody, and maintaining them. So everybody profited from it. Um, this <coughs> other colony from Chicago became another town that's even closer to us. Anybody know? Long, Longmont. Longmont. So it worked for a lot of us. Some of the colonies that did come out did have a hard time on um, mismanagement or whatever, and they didn't make it. But but it was a great start for, for the agriculture to start here. And, and they, like I said, they had the irrigation. They worked all that out. And then later, they also developed drought-resistant crops and learned to till the soil a little bit better. And they, you know, agriculture now was a big part of the community. Now, people uh, who lived in the city would have to buy their food. Uh, people that lived on the farms would grow their own, raise their own. They might trade with other farmers or ranchers for things they didn't have. And they also could buy in the city. And uh, They used catalogs a lot for the, for the tools and the things they needed for their homes and their farms. So that was um, another way to get started. Okay, we're going to go jump now to the walkers themselves. The walkers raised Galloway cattle. You know, that was their livelihood, though. So they may have had some beef, but they also had hogs. They had turkeys. They had chickens. Um, <coughs> there are deer around here. Uh, rabbits, we just saw one. <laughs> uh, they might... They, any hunting they might want to do, they could do the hunting for birds. Uh, and I don't know if they would use bear, but they were up here too, maybe. <laughs> they had a small garden to start with, the garden that you see here. Tell you what some of the things, I'm going to read these things off, and you don't have to remember all these things, but just to kind of give you an idea of what types of things were planted in this garden. Gooseberries. 
currents, actually, we have current bushes that, that go along, well, just after the blacksmith shop there, there's some current bushes that go along the property. Um, this is the chokecherry out here. They also have raspberries, rhubarb, lettuce, radishes, turnips, onions, carrots, summer squash, spinach, beets, parsnips, peas, and cucumbers. And then they had potato fields where they grew a lot of potatoes. They sold those. Um, tomatoes and corn didn't do real well up here, especially the tomatoes. We've tried growing tomatoes, and they just, it's just not hot enough, long enough for them to grow. But they did raise their, a uh, lot of their own food. When the family got bigger, the garden was moved to the other side of the corral, and it was a much bigger garden then. And the water would come down from the spring house, go down, go through the corral, pick up a little fertilizer, and then fertilize and water the garden that way. So they had a pretty good system going here. Once they grew their food, then they would have to find, or raise their food, then they would have to store their food. Uh, some of the places they store their food. One is the, uh, the spring house. Do you remember what's stored in the spring house? Anybody? Yes? Oh, you were here for, the, for when I did butter. <laughs> Just gave it away. Um, they, would, they would store the butter and the dairy products in the spring house, and they'd maintain the uh, temperature of a refrigerator, right around 40 degrees or so. Um, so it kept the dairy products cold. And they also have what's right behind us. Oh, kind of underground. Did you see that when you did the tour? Oh, oh, the bank of the vegetables. Oh. Uh, yeah. Root cellar. Root cellar. Very good. Okay, they had the root cellar. There's a chute in the floor where the potatoes could go down, so they had big bins of potatoes down there. A lot of the root crops were in the root cellar. That's not what it was called at, but um, so you would store things like potatoes and um, let's see, carrots, turnips, onions, things that grew underground usually lasted lo longer in there. Um, they also might store some of, some of their fruits. The apples would last pretty well in there, and um, if they canned food, they would put it there so it wouldn't freeze. And the root cellar maintains the temperature because it's a Below frost line, so it stays really cool, but it usually doesn't freeze. They had ways of dealing with freezing if it got really cold. And the dirt floor kept the humidity at the right level, so that that was also good for the, for the vegetables or fruits they store there. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Uh, now, once they put the things, the vegetables in the root cellar, though, that wasn't the end of it. I mean, they would have to go periodically turn the vegetables, check for rotting, throw away anything that's spoiled, because if one thing was spoiling and it was touching something else, then that would spoil. So it wasn't just put it in there and forget about it. They had to keep going in there and checking on things. The other thing they had, of course, was the granary. Um, and in there they would store things like, well, they would buy their sugar and flour and coffee in town and bring them up half a ton or a ton whatever they need to get, especially through the winter, and store things in there. And the tin canned goods that they would buy, they could store in there. Did they grow any grain out here? Not that I know of. I know, do you recall, I, I know James Walker, when he had property in Boulder, he won best grain at the Boulder County Fair one year. And that farm was right around where Boulder High is. For wheat, right. Uh, actually, hay is hay is classified as a grain. But it doesn't go in a granary. No. It goes in the big barn. Well, they got the wheat barn. What do they use the wheat barn for? Wheat? My guess? That, that, yeah. I mean, that's sort of well, if, if he grew it down in Boulder, he would probably haul it up here and store it. Oh, Diane, you're talking about on this site, growing grain. Is that what you were he asked, I was, and I, yeah. yeah, he asked oh, if they, and I didn't okay. think they did. Okay. Not that, uh, not that I've heard of. Okay, but that he did grow great bold. Right. Okay. Uh, 
I think you have to have a pretty solid ditch irrigation system to grow grain in a yeah. lot of space, and I don't think it's going to be too high. Also, not longer. Now, the next thing they'd have to do, they had a place to store food, but some foods needed a little more than just storage. Some needed to be preserved. And in 1858, something was invented that changed everything. Anybody want to take a guess at that? Yes? Car. What? Car. Cars? Not, not quite. No, 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 no. This has to do with preserving food. Mason jars? <laughs> mason jars. Here's a mason jar. This is the way they look. This is the shape of the mason jar that they actually have, that they were patented in 1858 on the bottom. And they came with zinc lids and a rubber seal. And when you process this, the rubber seal, the, once it was heated, um, then it would form a vacuum inside and the seal would compress and it would keep, keep the foods from spoiling. Except that the zinc top would react with some foods, especially tomatoes. So, about nine years after the mason jar was developed, a man named Boyd thought, well, I'm going to put a porcelain lid inside. So they had porcelain inside, which kept the some of the foods from reacting with the zinc top. So that made this even better. And now they were able to keep things from spoiling without having to dry them or just keep them in the root cellar. They could do peas, corn, beans, uh, tomatoes. They could have tomatoes now. Uh, if they couldn't grow them up here, they could buy tomatoes in town and then can their tomatoes. Uh, they could make, uh, they could can fruit. So this was, this really helped in preserving food. Okay. Uh, some of, some of the other things like cauliflower and cucumbers and even carrots would be pickled. They would make sauerkraut and have that. Um, some things were stored in brine, which is a saturated salt water until you know, the salt won't uh, dissolve anymore. You just it's, it's really salty water. They would also do this with their meats. They could pack meat in brine or pack meat in salt, just in layers and layers. Of, they used a lot of salt. They would also smoke their meat. Uh, the walkers did have a smokehouse um, in that general area, I believe. I, um, they, so they did use that. So hams and things were salted. Um, as Karen said, meat was once stored in this back room. Uh, there were apparently meat hooks still up above the ceiling that were sealed up in there. They could also dry some of their foods. And that's one of the activities that we do up here. When we're done cooking, we will get uh, pumpkin or apples, and we will cut them into chunks, and then have needle and thread, and let the kids put the chunks on the thread. And what we do is you put a knot, you put a chunk of apple or pumpkin on there, then you make another knot, and then you put the next one on. Do you know why? Anybody want to take a guess at why we do it that way? It keeps the stuff separated. Exactly. It keeps them separated. If the pieces are all together on a string, then the pieces that are touching have a chance of getting moldy. So uh, so the kids have a, have a good time doing that. When, um, when we're set up in here for, for the event, we have what most kitchens had at that time. We have a table. We, now we have some chairs. We usually have a bench or something. Um, we have our pie safe. They would have had something to keep their cooking utensils and pots and dishes in, whether it was a pie safe or a cupboard or even a dresser or whatever they had. They would have used that. Some people had dry sinks uh, where they would bring the water in and they would either zinc or copper line and they would wash their dishes and then there'd be a pan underneath. We don't have that, but we do have two um, large enamelware pots that we use and they just, they work fine. We stick them in the corner and we can, st we don't have our backs to anyone, we're doing them sideways. So when people do come in, 
we can still talk to them. And we have wash and rinse. <coughs> now, up here, uh, we have the spring house. If you lived in the city, you might have an ice box. But why buy an ice box and pay for ice or have to go get ice when you have your spring house? So, but that was one of the things that they, you also might have in um, a kitchen. Now, for the event, um, well, let me start with school days. For school days when we cook, we make the butter outside, and inside we make cornbread. And in case some of you haven't already guessed, our secret... Oh, don't give it away. <laughs> this is a secret recipe. So you're not allowed to tell anybody about the secret recipe. <laughs> People come up. And the, especially because I had one little boy begging me for the recipe. And and women, oh, you can always tell homemade cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. We said, oh, thank you. Yeah, we, like we do stick buttermilk in it, so that's kind of, yes, it makes it. Lots of yeah. um, we have several recipes that are, are from 1880s cookbooks. I put some cookbooks. These are my cookbooks, but the, several of these are at the lore property, and you can get them in the library. If you just want to get a basic, more more understanding of recipes and the way they cooked and the way they preserve foods, some of these are excellent. The Food on the Frontier, it's really easy to read, and it has all the basics in it, and then it has some recipes in the back. So if you just want a real general, you know, if, you're, if you know you're going to be working in the log house, and if it's something that interests you, you know, some of these books are great, and you can just, you know, you can get them. Like I said, they're at Lore, and um, I don't think they. We don't call it Lore. Agricultural Heritage Center. Shorty's place. Shorty's place. The Shorty's <laughs> Bar and Grill. Yes. Do you think that BB had to adjust recipes for altitude here? I don't know how high it is, but that occurs to me. Oh, probably. <laughs> Probably, um, although the recipes that, I mean, we don't adjust that much. Okay. I know you do it as does, you have to change. Yeah, mm -hmm. although we did make a cake once that kind of got out of control. Luckily, it was during an, during an advanced training, and it was just volunteers learning to cook on the stove and just the <laughs> lid on the pasta. Kind of scary, but <laughs> but we do have some recipes that we use. Um, we make things for the event like uh, stew of beef with dumplings. We've made ham steak, and we have a couple chicken recipes. One's a stewed chicken, and one is a braised chicken with mushrooms. That we made. Um, okay, that did it. I'm hungry. Now. <laughs> uh, we try to use what we can from the garden, so we'll go out and pick something and actually bring it in, and then wash it. And we try not to make things that are too labor intensive. They have to smell good. One of the things we make has to smell good. So the whole house is just people walking in and they're just like, it makes them hungry. Right onions. <laughs> yeah. Right onions and apples. Just, yeah, I mean, it, sometimes we'll make the ham steak, and the ham steak really doesn't take very long, but then we make stewed apples with cinnamon, mm -hmm. and the whole place just smells. Um, we also will make, you know, coleslaw or, or cucumber salad or, you know, something like that. And the public cannot taste. The health department will not let us do that because of obvious conditions that you know, we don't want to take a chance. When um, we make the butter, we do get the bread from Great Harvest, so it's store-bought, and we do put the butter on the bread, and, we, and that's the only thing that we're allowed to do. Yes? Well, what do we do with the food that they... Well, actually, the blacksmiths get it. <laughs> and if you behave yourself, you might get a little too. Um, yeah, if we have, especially the desserts. If we make desserts, then we usually pass it around to staff. But, you know, the public gets mad at us sometimes. Mm -hmm. We make um, gingerbread with whipped cream. Mm -hmm. We make apple crisp, and we've made rhubarb crisp. Mm -hmm. People prefer the apple. Mm -hmm. And we also make um, a scotch, it's called scotch bread or shortbread. And I actually used the butter that you made on Tuesday, and I made shortbread. That the recipe that we use up here. Mm -hmm. So I'll pass this around, and you can each take a piece if you wish. Um, let's see. Am I forgetting anything? No, I. You, 
The purpose is not to cook. The, the purpose is to engage the public and answer their questions and tell them what you're doing. Uh, so the blacksmith and the plowman, the paid um, interpreters, you usually get fed. If there's a little extra and you happen to be here, you can usually get a taste. Um, we, we try not to make, I was about to say, one year we made stew. Uh, but the volunteers said there was too much peeling and chopping, and so we don't even do that anymore. Some of the things are prepared ahead of time, like chicken. We prepare the chicken, put it in a Ziploc bag. When it com comes here, we dump it in the bed. We don't want touching and spreading and with all the different things that you have to be careful with now. So we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. Uh, any questions? Yes. Excuse me, I won't melt <laughs> So good, thank you. Well, um, how about eggs? Do they preserve eggs? Do they, preserve eggs? they can preserve eggs. Um, uh, you have to keep the air from going through the shell. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll pack them with salt. Um, sometimes they'll put them in something called Isinglass, which I can't remember exactly if it's some something that's mixed with water and, and you can submerge it. Uh, sometimes they put lard or wax on the eggs. Uh, there was one one way, and I can't remember exactly the way, said you can do it this way and the eggs will keep for three years. Wow. But they, wow. But they suggest you just use them for baking. <laughs> and not for yeah, mm -hmm. sunny side up. So there, so there were, yeah. Can you pickle them? The, um, Russians used to um, soak them in black tea, and uh, they were called hundred-year-old eggs. I don't know if they kept them for a hundred years. But they just <laughs> Maybe they just looked like it. Yeah, they looked, them. yeah, and they smelled like it too. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I used to have tea. Um, yeah, these are the recipes that we use, and this is a little case we keep them in. Um, if anybody wants to look at some of the recipes, you're welcome to do that. The, the shortbread recipe is really easy. It comes from um, a cookbook I found at the Carnegie Library, and it's a cup of butter, a half a cup of sugar, and two cups of flour. That's it. Wow. Real basic. So it's a really good recipe to make up here because it's, it's simple. It's a really good Christmas cookie. Write that down. Any other questions? Did you talk about how Phoebe would sell her eggs in Milk and Town, the eggs and... Oh, we talked a little bit about that with the butter making, yeah. Right, she would, butter. Yeah, with the little rows on, so they knew it was her butter, and it was supposed to be really good butter. The best. Yes. Diane, you mentioned wax covering eggs. Do you have any idea if, uh, how long an egg would last doing something like that, or...? They'd last through the winter. I mean, the hens usually are laying in the summertime, and then right. in the winter I think they slow down a bit, so... Um, like I think a lot of them would. And again, you know, it's one of those things where you store them all and then you break it and then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, it, it, they always had to be chunky. I mean, even their camp, when they used the mason jars, I mean, it was a great system, but it didn't always work. Um, but they knew. I mean, when it, you open it up and it smells funny or if there's something growing on top or... Or, or, or Yeah, it's all swelled up, yeah. you know, you just, you, you don't eat it. Yeah. But, or if I mean, your dog it takes a bite and he kills over it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I know. The youngest right. kid gets the bite. That's why they kept so many dogs. Tom! Oh, well, no, I'm just protesting. <laughs> you had tasters in court. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, home. You talk about tasting <laughs> and stuff like that. We just got back from Japan, and one of our <coughs> hostess at a uh, old fashioned inn was explaining what we had in front of us to eat. And we've been there a couple weeks, and she says, We have puffer fish oh, on here. Man. Tray. She says, you don't have to worry because I have a licensed chef that prepares it properly. And I thought, well, okay, you know, how, how fast does the poison work? And 
I figure my wife and I looked at each other and we ate ours. <laughs> the person in the group of four didn't. And we said, well, if we survive the night, fine. But when I got back here, somebody told me the puffer fish poison is like instant. Yeah, it is. Take nights. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to do research on, on herbs and cooking during the 1800s. And I couldn't get, I couldn't find any recipes. And this recipe actually had caraway seeds in it. Shortbread recipe? With caraway seeds in it. And so I thought, okay, this is an herb. I'm going to, you know, use this recipe. And, and then I decided it was better without. Yeah. And most people agreed. I was going to say, I didn't taste it. So. No. Yeah, it would be just like the apples you would um, reconstitute it when you were ready to use it. Just put it in hot water and it would plump up and, and they would uh, use it in pies or make pumpkin soup. Pumpkin candy. Pumpkin candy. Mm. That's so real good. It takes a long time, but it's good. So if you come during the event, we usually have pumpkins and apples hanging all over the place. <laughs> and the kids really enjoy it. No, thank you. That was very informative. Okay. And if anybody wants to look at some of the books, you know, see if they're interested in it. She's hiding checking them out. I want to watch you do it. That's what I like. I want to watch you do the cooking. Yeah. yeah. We did have an advanced training one year where several of us came up and just okay. cooked a couple of the meals and then had lunch. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, we can do that again this yeah, year. If uh, yeah. we want to do that, if anybody's interested, let Cole know and we'll try to set up a date where we can just come here. Counting is by Dutch oven for these ladies just cooking in up here too. We have we have a break pot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bad. Yeah. Oh yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay, just for us. Yeah. I mean we think we made that one. What do you want on the day? What do you want us to cook for you, Tom? Beef potatoes or a big loaf of bread? I don't care. Whatever you want. Just give me some of these. Just give me some of that Dutch oven. Well, we'll make stew of beef with dumplings this year. Oh yeah, that'll work. <laughs> About two nights. Just make it on the day he's here. I'll probably do both. I tell him night. Check the schedule. All right, speaking of schedules, on um, Sunday, June 9th, is going to be our dry run um, for the public. And again, that's the first summer day, and that's based on chores on the farm, whereas the second summer day is more um, recreation or the lighter side of ranch life. Um, so, we're going to uh, do the heavy stuff on the first weekend, and um, it's going to be chores, and, um, you know, Chuck will be in the blacksmith shop making, you know, uh, not decorative stuff, but more working stuff. Um, and here we'll have, what do we have? I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Okay. But we have cooking. We have some, something we'll be cooking, Something yes. we'll be cooking. Something we'll be cooking. And, um... Yeah, and so hopefully everyone um, will be able to attend that day. Everyone's going to need to come out to the Agricultural Heritage Center uh, in Longmont, where the costume bank is. It's a mile and a half west of Hover on 66 on the Ute Highway. Uh, before then, please call first. It helps us out if we know you're on the way. That way, if we're running around doing errands, we can uh, be there for you. And um, what I showed you the other night is eventually all of us will be on a matrix It'll be uh, a table uh, with our stations, and uh, we'll have some veterans and then, uh, some of us new folks, and so we'll just, uh, it's, it's more of an, even though the public's here that day, um, it's more for, um, as part of the next step in the training, so um, it's important that the public's there, and we're doing a dry run for them, and we tell the public that, you know, uh, this is preparation for the big event, 
during the fall. So come back to the big event. That's See if right. we've been through. That's right. So uh, thank you, every everyone, for coming. What a great group. I'm really excited about this. Um, thank you, Barry and Sharon. Yes. Sure. Yes. 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 The address is 8348 Highway 66, or Ute Highway is what they call it locally. 348. Mile and a half west of Hover. There's a big sign. And when's the best time? Is like there's somebody there all the time? Um, Tuesday through Saturday. Tuesday, Tuesday yeah. through Saturday. Tuesday through Saturday. Again, I can't write that. 8348. 8348. Ute Highway. Yeah, it's 1.5 miles west of Hover. It's, it's the place with the big bar rooms. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty neat. Once you, once you start driving down the highway, you'll see don't get that far things that say agricultural uh, museum signs. It's, it's just you'll see that it's all in space. How often are they? Just stay.